Please stand as you are able and join with me in this responsive call to worship. Give thanks with Hagar for the God who sees you when you have been cast out and rejected. Give thanks with Sephora for the honor of influencing greatness. Give thanks with Makeda, the queen of Sheba, for the leaders you have been and the leaders you have birthed. Rejoice, daughters of Zion, and take your place in history. Good friends, rejoice with the daughters of Zion and accompany them on the journey. We
Please be seated. Let us gather together in prayer. We come together today, Lord, to thank you for the mentoring of godly women who lived each day refusing to allow the word to remain shut up in their bones. With an ironing board as a pulpit, our mothers and grandmothers taught us the stories of the faith. From the cook stove, female friends, cousins, and aunts told us how to live. And at night, most often a woman knelt with us to pray. As we move from the ironing board to the boardroom, from the cook stove to the study and pulpit, remind us to continue to kneel with our sisters in prayer and to give thanks for ministries that could not be suppressed. Amen. Hear the word of God from the Hebrew scriptures, Isaiah 43. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And the scripture reading for today is from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up, stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. And now a reading from the book of Revelations. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people. And God himself will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. I want to thank Kathy, Kelsey, and Isla for inviting me to share this amazing day with you. It is a, a moment in history uh, for those of us who've been around a few years. It's, it's a special time at ILIF, and it is especially important to me that we are celebrating the life of Marilyn Phelps, uh, one of the amazing graduates of ILIF. On, on this very special day. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. The danger of preaching an anniversary sermon is the temptation to just regale you with stories from the past of our amazing conquest and our terrible failures and, and to somehow get bogged down back there and never quite get beyond it. Um, I'll try not to do that, although you'll hear me do some of that. But, uh, but it, it also the joy is the opportunity to lift up the beautiful memories of those amazing uh, pioneers, those courageous women who went before us and, and paved the way, those who followed their inner light, that deep sense of calling when the world was saying no all around them. So today, as we acknowledge the 60th anniversary of the full membership of clergy women in the United Methodist Church and the ordination of women in the Presbyterian Church USA, we acknowledge this story didn't start in the 20th century. So, so where do we go? How far back do we go to say, where did the story start? Well, I think a good place to start is probably with Isaiah. To go back to the powerful vision, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Those words, those powerful words, resounded through the centuries, touched lives. They were incorporated into the ministry of Jesus and to those who followed him. We heard about one such person today, the woman known to us, the unnamed woman known to us as the bent over woman. Can, afflicted for 18 years, can you imagine what it's like to just be able to look down? I want you to do, I invite you to do that physically. Just look down. What do you see? You see your toes. You maybe see the feet of the person next to you, the carpet, the floor. If you look to the right, you can get a glimpse of the windows or what's on your right side or your left side. But you have a very limited view of life, of the world. And Jesus encountered this woman and gave her the call, come here, come. You are now free from your bondage. And she stood up straight and started praising God right in the middle of the sanctuary of the synagogue where women weren't supposed to speak. And, and she couldn't help it, she had to do it. And life was never the same for her again. What happens when we look straight ahead we can see the world around us. We can see people. We can look in their eyes. We can make connection. We can see the needs of others. We can see where we could be in service. We can see new possibilities for life. And the woman's response was praise. And that praise came to others. Perhaps Mary of Magdala absorbed the story and she too became a woman who was not afraid to speak. The apostle to the apostles, she was called in the early days. And she was followed by others, Lydia, Priscilla, Dorcas, women of the early church, who felt they just couldn't keep quiet. 
in the early days of the women's movement in the church, we like to call Priscilla and Aquila the uh, first clergy couple. I don't know whether that was true or not, but we took a little biblical uh, license there, and, and we like to say that. Um, but we have all of these amazing women who have come before us. We get to the Middle Ages, we have those marvelous women mystics who spoke truth to power, who created communities, who moved in the world and in the church, who wrote, who prayed, who provided such models for women who would come after them. And the life-giving river flowed on. It flowed on into the 1800s when Jarena Lee, the first African-American woman licensed to preach in the African American uh, Methodist Episcopal Church was, was finally acknowledged. And, and it happened in a beautiful way. She was sitting in service one day and the preacher was preaching on Jonah. And she just felt he was not in the spirit. He just wasn't getting it. And, and, and so she, she jumped up and started preaching as she felt the word moving in her. And it was so powerful that the, uh, um, the bishop decided that he would give her her license to preach. She just couldn't help it. And that's the way it's been through the centuries. Women spoke because they were called and they had to say and share the truth that was on their hearts. We remember also within the Methodist tradition, Anna Howard Shaw, that woman of the 1800s who in 1880 uh, was finally uh, ordained uh, in the New York Conference of the, the Methodist Church at the time and spoke not only in the church but with Susan B. Anthony on the road working for women's suffrage, spoke on behalf of temperance, spoke on behalf of peace. It wasn't a one-issue thing. It wasn't about just women getting the right to preach. She followed her calling. For me, the experience is closer to home right here in Denver in the Rocky Mountain Conference of the United Methodist Church because that's my background. The first two women ordained in this conference were Fran Bigelow, uh, a woman who never married, who was assigned to churches on the fringes of the conference after serving as a missionary in South America, and, and who later served at El Macias Hispanic Congregation in Pueblo, bringing that church to its zenith of ministry. And the second one was Margaret Chevy, who after serving two years as a campus minister in Fort Collins, uh, as associate at First Church Fort Collins, became the bishop's secretary and spent the rest of her career in that position. But it wasn't something she resented. It was something she claimed as ministry and enjoyed. And it was only after her retirement that she took her first solo pastorate at a small church in Northwest Denver. Well, we were the Young Turks and we got organized and we got Margaret elected as the first woman to go to jurisdictional conference, something she felt she didn't really deserve but she stood up a little straighter and she represented us well. In the 1960s, there was only one woman ordained in the Rocky Mountain Conference, Pat Curtin Westlake. Pat came from uh, Texas, an SMU graduate, arrived here eight months pregnant, young, approached the bishop. She's already been ordained deacon. I don't know how she got that one through uh, in Texas, but she did. She had been ordained deacon, seeking her elders' orders. And the bishop of that time said, I'll ordain you, but only if you will sign this paper stating that you will never ask for an appointment and if you will immediately take voluntary location, which meant she was out of the system. In our system, it meant she had no claim on the system. Pregnant, vulnerable, young, no advocates, she signed the paper, she gave birth to Scott, and she went back to working as a Christian educator, as some like my good friend Marilyn and I did for, for many years, uh, for two fifty dollars an hour, no benefits, for the next five years, until the General Commission on Status and Role of Women was formed. And one of the members of the Secretariat, my dear friend and mentor, Nan Self, flew out to Denver 
found Pat because she was in she was looking for lost clergy women, women who had been ordained and weren't serving anywhere. Found Pat, encouraged her, strengthened her, and had a come to Jesus talk with the bishop. Uh, <laughs> Pat later received uh, her first appointment at University Park and went on in, for years of ministry. Well, in the 1980s, more of us came along, eight more of us came, in the 1970s, eight more of us came along. That was my generation. And in the 80s and 90s, more and more came, bringing us up to a critical mass. And in 19, I believe it was in 1990, Marilyn Phelps joined that group of elders after 10 years of working toward her ordination. And it was not an easy struggle for the women, but the spirit kept breaking through, doing something new. I don't know as much about the Presbyterian history, and for that I'm a little apologetic, but the first Presbyterian woman I met in this area was Jane Hayes, who is now in her 90s, a true saint in the faith, and she broke the barrier for so many women of her denomination. But life was more difficult for the Presbyterian women because unlike the Methodists who at least had a bishop, if you could find a friendly one, and we did find one in Mel Wheatley, then you could get an appointment and you had to be somewhere and somebody had to take you. So we had a system that was at least working in our favor. The Presbyterian women had to find a job, get hired, and then get ordained. And it was much harder for them. Uh, Cindy Curley, who was one of the Presbyterian women ordained in the 1980s, um, was well received by her local congregations and had a wonderful ministry through the years. But she told me the story of one of her first weddings, and she was feeling so good about the wedding. It was beautiful. The liturgy was nice. Everything went well. And as one of the guests was leaving, he said, are they really married? As if a wedding uh, officiated by a woman would not be valid. We had a lot of those kinds of stories that went on, but, but we also had uh, a few funny things. Uh, one of the cute things that happened to me when I had my first appointment at Lyons in 1979, I did what pastors of small congregations in small towns do. I went up down Main Street, introduced myself to all the merchants, got to know them, found out a little bit about them and their families. Uh, <clears throat> I had a great time in, in that little town then. It was a wonderful appointment. But uh, I went in one antique shop, and the woman said, uh, uh, Pastor Margaret, I want you to come to the back and meet my daddy. So I went back, and an old man sitting there, probably younger than I am now, uh, sitting there smoking his pipe, rocking back and forth. And she said, Daddy, I want you to meet the new Methodist preacher. He kept rocking. Finally, he took his pipe out, and he said, Well, I'll be damned put his pipe back in and just kept, <laughs> just kept rocking. I didn't know if I'd been accepted or rejected, but I, but I just kept on going. <laughs> but we would meet in gatherings. We would read scriptures like the ones you heard here today because we had to find strength. We had to go back to the well again and again for strength. We had to turn to community for strength. We had to remind each other that God was doing a new thing and that sometimes when God does something new, as one of my sisters once said, it involves call, it involves comfort, and it involves confrontation. And Jesus experienced all three of those as did the bent over woman in that experience because she experienced the call, the comfort, the healing, and immediately is thrown into controversy. <laughs> and that's the way it still happens today. When you follow the call, and even when you feel the comfort of your colleagues and community, if you take the path, <laughs> you're immediately thrown into controversy. And you have to turn back to community, back to that wellspring of hope for, for your, your own nourishment and your own renewal. Our new thing that we were following was vision-based in scripture. Usually our gatherings were interfaith, intergenerational, uh, interracial, and a mix of laity and clergy. We would just take anyone who wanted to be with us in those days, and we were, we were so happy when we could be together. 
We understood that we were not just working to break down the barriers for women, but we were working for all people. It was not just to get us ahead. That was never, ever the goal. But we saw ourselves as a reformation movement, something that would reform the whole church. We were very idealistic. It has not yet happened. <laughs> it's, it's still out there. It is still coming. It is still being born. The first um, petition that the Commission on Status and Role of Women formed in 1974 in this conference brought to annual conference was a petition asking for equal pay and equal benefits for lay women employees in the church. Those secretaries and Christian educators and choir directors and, and, and janitors and women who had, had worked hard for the church all the years but had never been compensated well for their work. That was our first petition. Our second was calling for a study on homosexuality. It was a second such petition to come to the conference. I don't remember now if it failed or if it passed. I remember bringing it, but I don't remember if it failed or passed. If it failed, it just got relegated to the bookshelves and the journal binders, and no one ever did much about it then. But it was there. The vision was there. Always the vision. Always ahead of us. Pulling us forward. Calling us to break new barriers. Our first workshop that we had was led by Dr. Robbie Bean, a well-known Denver educator and member of Park Hill Methodist. And it was on the bonds of racism and sexism and how the two were united. And how to break one, one had to break the other. And how freedom for one would mean freedom for all. So the, it was a broad movement. Sometimes it was scattered. Sometimes it was shotgun-like. But we did our best. And we tried to redefine power, not as a matter of position, but as a matter of spirit. And I think we see that in the young women uh, coming along today. Our personal growth was also enhanced by the growing number of women theologians and historians who, who fed our souls. When Jean Miller Smith arrived at Islef, we thought the kingdom had come. <laughs> we, 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 one of us, we had one of us. <laughs> uh, we, th we thought that was such a breakthrough. And that is not to say that we had not received support from so many of the wonderful men of the 70s and 80s at Iliff. And I could name a long list of those names of those wonderful men who mentored us and who are our advocates when no one else uh, was here for us. Uh, but Jean and the other women sort of validated our academic dreams. Yes, we could be scholars. Yes, we could learn more. We could do more. Um, we could think. We, we could interpret scripture. We could look at it through different eyes. There was a new way of, of doing something. Something new was coming into being. And on this day, when we celebrate this long sweep of history and all the women who've gone before with courage and integrity and faith, there's something sort of whispering in my ear saying, what will the next anniversary be like? Annie Rico Arnoldy, what are you going to write on in 40 years? <laughs> what will be your topic in 40 years? Annie was one of my wonderful uh, youth, and I heard her preach her first sermon at Hope United Methodist Church when she was a senior. One of the best sermons I ever heard. Uh, and, and they'll just, in 40 years, Annie, you're going to knock him dead, but, uh, as you do today. But Annie is representative of that new generation coming in with new ideas, new fearless. What new things springs forth today? What is the unfinished legacy that my generation left for your, yours? Almost everything from the 20th century is still out there to complete, folks. We haven't completed any of it. We just started, and it's still going. Um, Ryan mentioned Black Lives Matter. He mentioned other things, and they're still going, different forms, different challenges, different times. The clergy women and men today still try to find a way to hold their own values and beliefs true as they make their way through the system. Um, so how does one respond with integrity without being co-opted or burned out? 
uh, like the early women, the 21st century women and their male colleagues, have to ask, what does the Lord require of me? Not what does the system require of me, or even what does my local congregation require of me, but what does the Lord require of me? In this place, in this time, 